All right. So mobile development. Um, why do we talk about mobile development separate from like normal development? What, what are the characteristics that make uh, mobile development unique? What do you think? Yeah? <coughs> yeah. So specific operating systems, which are? iOS and Android, and Android is beneath the Android layer, what the actual core operating system? Yeah, Linux. So that's true. Uh, so that part here is um, some of the things on Android that kind of like normal Unix, normal Linux, right? So some of the system calls, uh, if you're interacting with the with the operating system, will be kind of the same. Uh, but we have um, so we have kind of a stack. So at the bottom we have the operating system, and we have the hardware. So operating system kind of isolates us from the hardware and allows multiple processes to use the hardware. And that's what we have here. Um, and then on the hardware, we have kind of a, some unique features as well. So what's kind of unique about the mobile phones hardware, yeah? Mm, depending on the settings of the screen, it can be uh, vertical. vertical. Yeah. So we have uh, different screen layouts. So screen needs kind of a separate category. So first of all, we have two different layouts. We have horizontal or portrait, right? Um, and that already is a bit weird because normally with the PC, we don't have that duality. We have just one kind of aspect ratio and one resolution. Uh, we might have windows, but uh, usually we don't deal with these two uh, types. And secondly, we have a problem of size, right? So if I kind of um, open a typical, I don't know, um, studio cluster. So if I open kind of an on a PC, uh, there are some nice, yeah, whatever, like for example, this, right? Uh, if I open UI like this, can I work with UI like this on the phone? Not really, because it's like uh, the selection will be too tiny, right? Uh, so we can't really work with UI, which we used to work on a PC, on a mobile phone, because we don't have enough physical real estate. We have enough pixels, we can display it. It's just unusable, right? Um, so, um, so we have the orientation which makes it different, and we have the size, okay? So normally, um, I mean, historically, it, it has, yeah? Uh, I can stream, I am recording it. Are people watching it on, this, on the feed? Sure, so I can uh, start streaming. Just give me a second. Check. Hmm. 
All right. So I think it will be streamed in the channel in the main. Um, um, yes. Perfect. All right. So uh, size and um, historically, what what happened was we had a certain resolution of the screen. And we were kind of uh, depicting icons and everything using kind of a pixels, right? So we have, for example, 48 by 48 pixels, kind of a button. And then on the screen, it was defined like this. Um, now it is kind of changing a little bit because of the very high resolution uh, screens. But it really changed because of the mobile phones. Because on the mobile phones, the physical um, dimensions were more important, okay? So, for example, if I have a... If I have a screen and I have two buttons, right? Uh, those dimensions here and here are kind of designed and the kind of the rest the rest of the space, right? Um, we kind of have two options. We can either make it relative to everything, so we always define percentages and remember in uh, HTML we can define some things using percentages, right? That this is like 10% of the width. This is 5% of the width and so on. But it's a little bit tedious to work with percentages because if I kind of use percentages everywhere, like it kind of needs to add up to 100, but we don't really like to think this way. It's a little bit harder because um, it's all relative. So you can do that, but normally what we do is kind of absolute values. And we, for example, want to say that those uh, buttons are like 48 by 48 pixels, right? But then depending on the density of the screen, if you say 48 pixels on a 4K display, it will be really tiny. If you say 48 pixels on a, uh, you know, a 320 by 240 pixel screen, it will be really large, right? And we don't want those buttons to change size, even though we use kind of a pixel notation. So what we use on mobile phones, and it's starting to happen on our PCs as well, instead of... Um, um, uh, so we, we have something which is called device independent pixel, right? Um, so device or resolution independent pixel is something that is kind of uh, translated into actual physical space, right? So we, we kind of defined a pixel to be of certain size, um, which is independent of the resolution of the screen. And then we can say this, this um, button is 48 by 48. And then it, it roughly is the same on a 4K display or on this one. It's uh, roughly the same uh, size, right? Do you get the idea? So instead of using kind of physical pixels, we have kind of a virtual pixel, which is always the same size, independent of the resolution of the screen. And then we can lay out the elements using this kind of um, resolution independent pixels and then use them to kind of lay things out for us, right? So if I say, um, if I have 48 by 48 um, button, and then I have 96 by 96, I will know this one will be always twice as big as this one, and this one will be roughly size of like an icon on the home screen to press to launch the, um, um, the application, right? So screen, the size, and the kind of the, the resolution. So even though the resolution is excellent, we have 4K mobile phones now. We can pack a lot of pixels. Usability-wise, we have to think how to kind of work with the really small real estate that we have. So that's what the size is. Um, what else? There is a, one small tiny bit about the screen uh, that is also relevant on a, a mobile phone, but not so much on a PC. Yeah? The touch screen, yes. So touch. Um, it is getting more like we have laptops with touch screen as well, uh, and the the um, the technology is kind of evolving. So we have touch and we have gestures, right? We historically were not programming interaction with a PC using kind of a gesture or touch, but I mean it is. A little bit coming into, but most of the laptops which have touch screen, they didn't change much of the UI they have. Um, so they use the same kind of uh, metaphors as on, like traditionally with the mouse. 
uh, but it may kind of change. On the mobile phones, those and tablets, we heavily use touch and uh, gestures, right? So that's, so we kind of discussing the hardware, so screen is one. What else? What else is uh, different hardware-wise? Um, oh yeah, one, one small thing about the screen um, on mobile phone, it, uh, it can be off, right? So the screen can be turned on and off, right? Um, so that kind of means something, right? Uh, also, it can be locked, right? So it is not kind of a big deal uh, when you're programming something to run on a laptop. Do you think about a laptop screen being off? No. Do you think about the computer being kind of um, locked with the login screen? No. You, you just think, okay, my app either runs or I don't care, right? On a mobile phone, it, it is kind of important if your app is in the foreground, it's occupying the, the view, and then you're doing all the processing and everything. So let's say you program a game, uh, then when your game is up in the face of the user, you kind of are heavily using like, you know, 60 or 90 frames per second, you know, processing to do what you need to do. But the moment the screen goes off, or the moment the user brings another app in front, should your game still do 90 frames per second processing? No, it should kind of go to sleep. Like apparently your user is not looking at it, you're not, not using it, right? So those events are kind of important and we react to those events. We have to program the logic of what happens if the user is looking at your app or if the, another app is on, on top, right? Uh, so those events are kind of important. So what else? What else hardware-wise we have um, that's unique? Yeah? Sensors. Sensors. That's right. So I will put sensors here. So we have gyro. What other sensors do we have? Gyro is also used for orientation. We have proximity sensors. So when you when you're bringing your phone next to your ear, you've noticed that the screen disappears, that it gets black, and then when you take it out, it, sh it shows up again. Why it's doing it? To conserve battery, right? Um, so when you're listening to a call, when you're talking on the phone, obviously you're not gonna be touch typing on it, right? So the phone detects when you have it close to your ear or not. So there is a proximity sensor, there is a light sensor, there is a GPS, uh, there is a temperature sensor, pressure sensor. There's a lot of sensors packed into modern mobile phones. Um, and we can use them for a, a number of things. Uh, we can use them to gather some information from outside, but we can also use them as events when programming the app, right? So again, when there is a phone app and the phone app is for talking, it detects when you have it kind of uh, close to your ear, therefore the screen is not needed, so it turns the screen off. Um, so sensors is a big one. Uh, we mentioned battery. Uh, so battery is another important aspect of the hardware that we don't really think about. We are kind of getting more conscious about uh, um, energy efficient programming and energy efficient development for server side applications and so on. But it's not such a big deal on a PC. But on the mobile phone, it is a big deal. Like if your app chews up the battery, it will not be good, right? So you need to program such as to conserve the, the energy, right? Uh, what else? Yeah, that's right. So CPU itself um, is different, um, and we typically cannot um, use the binaries developed for uh, you know x86 and so on um, on a PC on, onto the uh, mobile. So you know the king in mobile space is ARM. Um, it's a different computing architecture than x86 that we use in uh, PCs. Um, and that brings a little bit more complexity into development because we need, for example, to emulate what the app is doing. Uh, we need an em emulator, which is running on the Intel x86 architecture. And then we need something to run on the, on the ARM. So most of the emulators have kind of a dual mode. You can either have um, 
the emulator of the architecture and then run everything native on ARM, like architecture, but that is that needs to interpret what the ARM is doing to interpret it to your x86 layer, right? Or you can have an x86 emulator, which emulates the kind of the logic of the higher level of the uh, of the app stack, but and and then it's more efficient, right? So we can either have the emulator kind of emulating here, emulating the hardware, or we can have it here to emulate kind of the software, but the hardware runs natively on x86. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right, so did we cover anything else apart the hard, uh, for the hardware that it's kind of unique? Um, yes, there is one couple of extra things. So for example, uh, networking, right? Uh, mobile phone have networking capabilities and they can be connected to internet but the connection to internet tends not to be reliable right you may go drive you know you're taking a train to Oslo and you go into a tunnel suddenly the network is off and then suddenly the network is on again right um, you may have local connectivity so you, you, you can kind of uh, work in an ad hoc fashion right so Let's say network, and we have connectivity issues. Um, connectivity issues, and we have uh, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer mode, right? So we can connect our phones here using Bluetooth to talk to each other. Um, we can kind of do that with PCs as well, right? So most PCs have Bluetooth connectivity, um, but in the mobile phone space, you have Bluetooth, you have NFC, you have uh, Wi-Fi Direct. You have kind of a number of options to make the devices talk to each other, right? Uh, and you can set up the connection, you can tear it down. Uh, then official communication, like with the uh, cell towers, can go on and off. So we need to think about those things as well. Uh, when you're programming for a server, or when you're programming for a PC, you usually check, okay, if I don't have a network, I raise an exception. The app usually kind of uh, stops working, right? Like not having a network if you're running a server is a kind of a major problem, right? So you either crash or what, what else can you do? Like if you're bootstrapping a server, web server, and there is no network, like, okay. Sometimes you bootstrap it, and then it's the operating system responsibility to manage the network, right? So your server is running, but nobody can talk to it and it cannot talk to anything because the network is not running, right? So if you're trying to establish a connection and it times out or it cannot establish, then you kind of put yourself to sleep and you do something or you say, okay, I'm panicking, like it's a major problem and we can't recover from it, right? Um, on mobile phone, it's a normal thing. Not having a network for a, for a while is a normal thing. So you have to have a mechanisms for kind of, um, first of all, for retrying, for trying it out, and also for um, like batching things, right? So let's say you have a number of apps which need to fetch something from the, um, from the internet and the connectivity went down for 30 seconds. Then if those apps kind of uh, all try and try and try you have kind of a, a bit a bit of a mess on on like on the network um on the um app space because all those apps are kind of uh trying to retry and it may cause kind of um too much processing or too much traffic right so what usually happens is all those apps say to the service okay i need to fetch it from the web when the web network is available please fetch it and let me know and that's it they don't do anything else they kind of wait for it to finish and get back, back a callback, right? And this services needs to be sort of uh, across multiple apps because they all need to coordinate uh, and they all need to get the, the kind of a networking going. All right, so we kind of have differences in the hardware. OS, um, that is, yes, it is a different OS, but it's not as, as um, uh, strange compared to the, to the hardware and to the kind of a software layers that need to deal with it. So here we have some sort of a SDK support, like library support to interface with the OS. We don't typically deal with OS directly. 
we do it through some sort of a, a support layer. We have some sort of a virtualization um, which separates. So at, at here you have your you have your program, and this program needs to be sort of separated because we have different architectures, different ARM CPUs running similar OS um, um, across multiple devices. So when we develop an APK and it needs to run on like 4,000 different Android devices, we don't know what sort of hardware is there, right? Um, and even though the OS is kind of more or less um, um, isolating us from the hardware, there is the need for some sort of virtualization of making this independent of the lower layers, right? Um, so this is kind of universal, it's like a universal binary, uh, but it's not really a binary, it's kind of usually a bytecode, right? So we have some sort of bytecode layer here, and then it gets compiled to the um, native platform of the, of the mobile device. So here we have this sort of, uh, like you can call, well, all of this is either a kind of iOS or Android, but it's not just the OS layer, it's kind of all those layers all the way to your kind of application stack, right? Um, so your application will, do, will use some libraries, some sort of uh, functionality, which is here, and your library is kind of, your software is isolated to some sort of virtualization kind of a machine that translates what you compiled into what actually runs on the, on the hardware. So that's, more or less how it looks like. And here we have the sort of um, uh, key elements that differentiate mobile development from um, PC development, right? So as you, as you see, for example, with the orientation or for example, with the battery events, um, battery getting low uh, with the network events, we have kind of a, by default some sort of um, metaphor that we, the app needs to kind of react to certain events that happen in the operating system, right? Um, so we have, um, for example, networking going down, then the operating system realizes, okay, we, we lost the network connectivity, then it announces to all the apps kind of an event saying, the network is down, deal with it. And then when the network comes back, it uh, releases the event saying, okay, um, the network is back up again. And all the apps can register interest on into those events, like battery getting low, battery being charged. For example, if you have a kind of a machine learning app and it needs to do heavy processing and your, your, your phone is not plugged in to power, then it may kind of uh, slow down and may try to use the battery more efficiently. But if your phone is plugged in and it's charging, the app can kind of use the full power, can use the CPU to the fullest extent, right? So events like this are kind of important. So on both platforms you have, uh, on all platforms, but we, in reality, we only have like iOS and Android, really. Um, I was uh, checking the market, um, so, So if you, yes, I had the slide somewhere. And it effectively from like two years, um, There is basically only two that count. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, let me change. Yes, so this is, um, This is the stats, and it kind of um, suggests that 74% uh, 
is Android, 24 is um, iOS, and then a very tiny amount, and the Windows, uh, Windows Phone and Windows OS for the mobile platform it was prob uh, um, kind of uh, phasing out. Microsoft shut it down two or three years ago. They kind of discontinued the um, the mobile space, um, and then like Samsung and some other small vendors are kind of trying to work out on a proprietary operating system, but it's kind of very insignificant. Uh, so we effectively have two. Uh, we have Android and iOS. Um, what are the differences between um, Android and iOS? How many of you have iPhone? Two and Android, everybody else? So it's kind of similar to the stats, <laughs> right? Uh, quarter of the room has um, iOS and everybody else has Android. So have you used the other platform? So what, what are the differences? What are the characteristics? So f first of all, uh, Apple and Google are two different companies. Um, Google is a software company which um, makes revenue based on advertisements, right? Uh, Apple is a hardware company which makes most money on the hardware, on selling the hardware, right? So they have kind of different objectives. Uh, so Google wants their software to be as free and as widely uh, distributed. And Apple doesn't want their software to run on anything else. They want their software to run on their hardware because that's where they make most money. Um, so the philosophy is a little bit different because Google has uh, Android being produced and sold by a lot of different manufacturers because Google itself is not a hardware company, right? So they have uh, deals with uh, manufacturers to um, package up the phones with the Android operating system and that's why the kind of um, fragmentation of the Android ecos ecosystem is massive. There is literally all over 4,000 different um, um, types of devices that run Android. So when you're developing for Android and you want to publish it in the, in the Google Play, it will tell you how many different devices that there are like uh, in, in real time. Whereas with Apple, they kind of control the hardware and they have much smaller number of different devices that kind of run iOS. Um, that's, that's one difference. The second difference is Apple is very much closed. It's a single company show. So the operating system and the hardware is kind of a very control of what is there and how it runs. Uh, Android is not really an operating system. Android is a platform uh, because each manufacturer can tailor uh, the operating system to their um, uh, to their needs. So if you go to um, um, yeah, so this is just kind of a yeah. So if you go. To source, um, you will you will see that um, it's an open source project. So Android is by majority of the code base is an open source project uh, where each vendor can kind of add their own proprietary uh, components. And Google is adding some proprietary components in the form of Gmail, Google Play Store, and so on, which is kind of bundled up in your typical Android deployment, but the core of the Android is open source. Uh, and Google is also contributing back to the Linux kernel quite heavily because they did a lot of improvements and they kind of are uh, helping the community to maintain the, the Linux uh, operating system. So what, what is important here to realize is that Android kind of came about as a, as a result of a consortium work, not all of a Google itself. Uh, there was a 
uh, kind of a, a, a shift from very um, silo-like telecommunication operators controlling all the mobile phones, like back in the era of Nokia. Um, so if you go back in time, all the phones were kind of very strictly controlled by the operators. And in some cases, you couldn't even buy a phone where you could change the SIM card to a different operator. You were kind of tied in to that particular operator. Uh, and the SIM cards were kind of uh, bundled with the phone itself. Um, and that has changed uh, because for consumers, it was kind of not that good. Uh, we didn't have the freedom of choice of what devices we want to use. Uh, so there was a kind of a big push towards um, kind of um, freeing it. And Google was kind of a major player. Um, so initially, um, there was kind of a, a race for a smartphone. Like there were multiple companies and even open source project kind of are working roughly 2007, 2006, 2008 in that kind of a space. Uh, how to deliver kind of a, a work, working kind of a mobile phone and um, a smartphone, I mean. Nokia at that time was kind of leading. They had um, phones which had kind of a big screen, big touch screens. Uh, but they were using Symbian operating system and they were quite hard to program and they were also quite hard to use. So people who, and they were very expensive at the time as well, as all novelties are. So th there was not a lot of market uptake, but there were kind of a conceptual work done earlier. And then most of the op uh, operators were kind of controlling it. So like you couldn't buy, um, for example, a, a early iPhones without a plan. You had to buy it with a plan from the operator, right? Now you can buy an iPhone from anywhere and use with any operator, but uh, initially that was not the case. Um, so Google was the first to kind of uh, break the ice. And to do that, it, it has to get the operators on board, right? Uh, otherwise it wouldn't work because legally uh, it's kind of controlled in each country what telecommunication devices are being sold in that country. So all devices that have telecommunication capa capabilities, radios and TVs and um, mobile phones and so on, they have to be certified in a given country. Um, and to, to do that, it was done through the operators. So the operators were certifying different phones and then they could be used in a country. It has changed because the manufacturers now certify their devices across all the operators, right? Um, so Google got on board kind of a global uh, alliance of different operators and manufacturers, and they are kind of behind the Android uh, platform. And there is over 100 of different institutions and companies which are kind of involved in it. Whereas with Apple, well, it's only Apple, right? So Apple had some agreements with operators initially, and now it has kind of the more kind of a blanket agreement of how to certify their um, the hardware. Uh, but the philosophy behind the platforms is really, really different. Um, when you're publishing an iOS, you have to go through the approval process. Um, you have to pay annual fees in a f roughly $200. Otherwise, your apps will not be listed on the App Store. And also, your apps can be kind of easily taken off the App Store if Apple thinks you're kind of competing with them with some of the core functionalities, right? And it happened in the past quite heavily. Whereas on Android, you can publish anything and you, there is kind of no approval process. So what are the advantages of uh, Apple versus Android? Yeah? I don't know if it's an advantage, but Apple is like really, uh, they don't talk backwards from the uh, compatibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the uh, Android situation is that you can go back or at least some, a couple of iterations, yeah. uh, but Apple is like really radical about that. And if they say, we don't support that feature anymore, that thing will shut down at a given time, and if you are still using it, then it's not right. Yeah, that's right. So that makes it kind of really hard because some of the new, um, new apps and new operating systems are not supported on the older devices, and then you are forced to buy a new device, basically, right? So that is kind of... Um, well, that's in their favor, right? Because they kind of stimulating people buying new devices, upgrading the hardware, and they making the revenue based on the hardware that they sell, right? 
So it's kind of um, one of the um, tactics to kind of generate the, the revenue. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So both um, screen resolutions and sizes, as well as the hardware itself, is more standardized. There is less uh, diversity. Uh, it's really hard to support Android um, and to make it kind of look good on across all the board and across all the devices. Uh, what else? Yeah. Exactly. So you have the kind of the more of a freedom on Android. You don't need to ask permission to publish anything. You can publish anything. Of course, there are some uh, checks kind of done automatically. So if you, um, like, you know, certain things are illegal. So, and Google needs to comply, right? So for example, you can't have uh, porn that is visible to children, right? So there are certain age restrictions for the apps and they check it. There is certain content which is kind of a prohibited in some countries, some jurisdictions that's being checked as well. But normally you can publish everything and then they will take it down if you violate some of the permissions, right? In with Google, it's the, uh, with Apple, it's the other way around. They will check first and then allow or not allow it to be published. Uh, takedowns are, are more rare. Uh, takedowns on Google are more frequent and you do have more malicious apps or more malware and so on on Android because it's kind of a reactive checks, right? Um, both vendors can take apps down. So they can remove apps from the app stores and they do that. Um, Apple can, um, so and, and both platforms can remove the apps from your phone as well. Um, so you can, uh, some apps can be forced to be deleted from the phone if they were officially installed using the um, Google Play or Apple App Store. Um, typically, App, Apple or Google don't do that, uh, but for some malicious content, they might. Um, and you have this um, um, more kind of an open development philosophy. So for example, with Android, you can download the free software stack, develop an app, and there is one time membership fee, which is about $25, and that's for life. And then you can publish it on the Google Play, right? And then your app will stay there forever un until you violate some uh, new permissions. So for example, uh, we had published some students' apps in the past, and now Google is asking us about age restriction for children. And if we don't do that, then the app is not visible in the app store until we kind of clarify it, right? Um, otherwise, there is no extra cost for, for having your work published. And also, if you're not breaking any law, your app is like easily reach, reaching kind of um, millions of people and it costs you nothing, right? Uh, you can release a free app like this. With Apple, you have the ongoing costs. So the moment you stop paying the subscription fee, they take your app from the, from the app store. And even for developing and testing, you cannot even um, put the app on your own phone for free. You have to pay this membership, even if you're not planning to redistribute it, right? Um, so you will not have a developer's key for kind of uh, testing your app if you don't register as a developer uh, with Apple. So they kind of make it harder for people to get on but then also they kind of tie them in to the, to the platform more. Um, okay, so um, those are the two main platforms. There are some things to, um, to think about. So before the break, um, I will just do one extra thing about the, um, the screen, and then we talk a little bit more about the life cycle of apps and um, the programming itself in the second half. So, screen. So we talked a little bit about the device independent uh, pixels. Um, so originally it was kind of called device independent pixel, dip, but then the I was dropped. So usually now you see DP, right? So it's a device independent pixel or resolution independent pixel and so on. The second thing is that 
as you've mentioned, we have um, portrait or horizontal layouts. Okay. On the screen, we can kind of we cannot show too much, right? So usually, when you're interacting with your phone, you see that each interface is relatively straightforward. And then to get more complex functionalities, we have those screens kind of us showing up, right? So we have kind of like a stack of different screens, and then we sort of um, um, put new th new stuff on top. So for example, if you have a launch screen, you have the icons, and then if you double tap on the icon, the app will take over the entire space, right? Uh, on a PC, what will happen? Well, the window will show up, right? And then you can still screen your, your desktop, and then you can double click on another icon and have another window showing up, and you can have multiple concurrent things on the screen because you have quite larger screen, right? Here, we usually have just one thing occupying the whole um, uh, the whole um, real estate of the screen. So if I have um, if I have let's say a mail app, right? Gmail. I will have folders for, um, so I have kind of a view where I have um, folders with my messages. So let's say this is inbox and I have my messages like here. And then if I click on the message, I have all the details of the message, which is the actual message and the header with like a to field, from, date and so on, right? So typically, on one screen, I may have a list of my e inbox messages. And then if I click on one, I get to another screen, which has this header and the body, right? So body is here, header is here, and then I see the details. And I can go back, pick another message, and so on, right? That's how you kind of interact with the mail. If I have a horizontal view, I can kind of, I have enough real estate, then I can have the list here and the, uh, the header and the body here, right? So I click on a message and it kind of shows up here, right? On a tablet, for example. Uh, on the mobile phone, even if you turn it around, we tend to have only this kind of a single, um, single screen on the screen, but here we can have two, right? So when you're designing an app which has multiple screens, um, and sometimes you combine them, sometimes you show only one at the time, we need a mechanism to kind of uh, allow us to deal with those. So in Android, we call those things fragments, right? So this is called fragment. Um, and the thing that is kind of managing the fragments and it's like the app which manages the screen is called activity. So an activity, activity, activity is something that has UI and that manages everything else related to the app. And the activity before uh, historically was kind of having a single fragment which was occupying the entire screen. But now you can have a fragment manager and you decide what is shown on the screen without changing the activity, right? So when you have your home, um, so here, let's say it's your home uh, screen. So home screen is an activity which manages all the icons and all the apps that you have kind of installed on the phone, right? So I have uh, kind of icons on my desktop and I have some sort of a, a menu system kind of in the bottom. And then if I double click, I launch this activity, which is the app that kind of is behind the icon. So then this new activity will kind of uh, take over the entire screen, will show up on the top. And if I press back button, I will go back to my home screen. But this activity can have multiple fragments. And while interacting, interacting with this fragment, I can cause the change, right? So sometimes when you open an app and you open a couple of things, you need to press back button multiple times to get back to the home screen, right? Sometimes you just need to press it once and it kind of goes to the home screen directly, right? Because what happens is on the, on the stack, we only put activities, not fragments, right? 
So each activity, which is when it's launched, it's sort of like a program. It's put on top of the of the stack, and then the back button takes it off and puts you back to the previous one, which was on the top. Right? Makes makes sense. But the fragments are kind of the visual aspects of what is on the screen. And then a single activity can either launch a new activity and show new things on the screen, or a single activity can use Fragment Manager and change the view of the screen by showing up a new fragment, right? And then the kind of the showing off of the new fragment is managed by the um, um, Fragment Manager. And the fragment manager manages the back button as well. So you can, you know, it depends how do you program the fragment manager to react to the back button, uh, and how do you program the activity to manage the back button, right? Um, so fragments are just visual layouts of what's on the screen. Fragment manager manages the, the layouts, and the activity is the kind of one of the core components of the, of the platform, of the Android platform which is kind of an equivalent of the app, right? But it's not like a single app on Android can have multiple activities, right? And each of those multiple activities can be an entry point to, the, to your app. So it's not like uh, in C or C++ where you have only one main function and that's the one which starts the app and that's it. Uh, here you can think of it like having kind of a package where you have multiple main functions, potentially. Each of those main functions can have a UI, and you can launch more than one of those. And even when you launch only one, initially, like even if the app only has one icon on the screen, which typically is the case, it doesn't mean it doesn't have more than one activity built in. So a good example here is, uh, for example, a uh, camera app, right? So the camera app, will kind of usually launch itself, and then you can uh, take a photo, but you can also preview the photo. You have kind of a preview screen when you kind of are looking at the, at the scene. Uh, it has filters, it has menus, and so on. Sometimes they occupy the whole screen, sometimes they kind of show up as a fragment. But usually you have um, kind of one of the activities is the one which takes the photo, right? Um, so what happens is from your other app, like when you're developing an app, for example, for uh, jogging and you want to take a photo, what you can do is you can ask the app from the camera, the, the camera app, to launch a particular activity from the camera app to show up on the top of the screen, take a photo, and then disappear when the user finishes taking the photo, right? Um, so you see that with some of the social media apps where they, like, they ask you, do you want to take a photo, and then they don't have a built-in app, they launch your default system app to kind of uh, take the photo. So you, you can kind of design, when you're developing, it's more like developing a library which has functionality plus some visual elements and they can be reused across multiple other activities, right? And that's kind of unique for um, Android because you don't need to know a lot of details about somebody else's app. You only need to know what they expose as the activity that can be launched from somebody else's activity. And then this is completely independent. On iOS, you cannot do that. On iOS, each binary is kind of a self-contained. And if you want to use somebody else's functionality, you need to bundle it up into the iOS app as a single binary, right? So this kind of uh, ecosystem of functionalities across different activities is not available to developers. It's kind of available in the, um, in the Android system. And Android is using kind of a concept of intents. Um, but yeah, let's, let's do that after the break. So for, for this, um, we, rock, we, we finish with the concept of the activity and the concept of a fragment. You have questions about this? Kind of conceptually? Make sense? Great. So, 10 minutes break.
All right, so here, um, this is, um, so as I, as I was explaining, um, if one app knows how to call an activity from another app, it can launch it, it can, it can do this, right? So here we have um, kind of a registry, it's, it's called open intents. And this open intents um, shows up a number of intents, which are basically like a, like a um, constant string, which you need to use to kind of register yourself into or um, provide information about. So for example, this one is um, um, an intent which you can launch and then respond with the string, which is the version number of your app, right? So then what your app will do is your app will say, I can react to this intent. And then when somebody, when the, the intent comes to, to you, to your app, you kind of reply with the current version of your app. So then anybody can ask, okay, um, who can reply to, um, to app, to the version of the app? And then you kind of get all the versions of, of the apps that are kind of on, on your phone. Or you can ask specifically. So you can say, this app here, I know you here, what version are you? And then the app responds with the version number. So it's kind of a useful meta information about um, uh, versioning of your app because it's not only human readable, but it's machine readable. So it can be kind of used by other, other apps. And you can have a lot of other intents or another, um, uh, like for example, pick, file pickers. If your app does something with files, you can register that you can, you know, somebody can use you to pick a file from the file system um, and so on and so forth. So you have a number of, um, you know, a lot of intents which are kind of unified, which are kind of standardized. And then if your app does any of those standard uh, activities, um, you can sort of register yourself and then uh, be useful to this ecosystem of um, um, of application components, right? Um, because you don't know who might use you, right? So if you are a camera app, uh, you have no idea who might need to take a photo and who might need to use your camera app, like programming wise, right? So it's like making your functionality available to other apps, to other programs. Uh, so this ecosystem is a very interesting concept. And as I said, it's quite unique to, um, to Android, uh, it, it doesn't exist on iOS. All right, um, so we covered um, an activity and, uh, and, and the fragment. So before I cover the other um, three uh, components of, on the Android platform, how about we just start Android Studio and I will uh, finish a little bit about the intents. So, um, intent is like a message. So, an intent has a type like what what we seen here uh, with those um, yeah with with this kind of identifiers, and it can have a bundle which is some data, right? So, in Android, we have a concept of a bundle, but it's kind of similar on iOS as well. Um, and a bundle is effectively kind of a key value store value, um, where the values are of specific types, right? So inside a bundle, I can put, um, you know, I can put string, string into string, but I can put string into some other type, like an integer, a float, uh, another structure, and so on. So we have kind of an ability to nest data uh, to be passed around. So if you need to pass a data to another activity, you can kind of bundle it up into a bundle and use an intent to, um, to pass it. So I'm kind of launching an Android Studio. It says, okay, I want a new project. So we will say that. Uh, and then it will ask me what type of project I want. And you can have a very basic activity, so with the kind of an action button, a completely empty activity, an activity with a navigation kind of at the bottom, um, 
and so on. So you have different types uh, of activities like with Google Maps, like with login. So it has pre-populated UI with a fragment for collecting the login data and so on. We start with a, with a completely empty one. And then we kind of uh, call it um, new empty application. And then um, there is a package name. So the package name is, um, is a namespace where your code lives. It's the same as namespaces in C++ or packages in Java. It, it's, the, the, it's exactly the same concept, right? Um, okay, so then we can choose, um, we can choose, we were just discussing it, we can choose to develop in Java or we can choose to develop in Kotlin. Uh, both of those languages compile into Java Virtual Machine and they work on a kind of a JVM uh, layer. Although in, in the context of Android, it's not strictly true because they don't really run JVM, they run kind of a Dalvik, they run different virtual machine, which is, um, but the source models for the source programs is kind of Java or Kotlin. Uh, you can also use Flutter. Flutter is a different um, infrastructure which uses Dart as a programming language. And I don't have it installed and that's why it probably doesn't show up here. I would probably need to install a Flutter and Dart extension into Android Studios. Android Studio to have it. Uh, so I will use Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin is a more modern programming language which is kind of an improvement over what Java was offering. Uh, it has more succinct syntax. It, it's kind of um, a little bit better in terms of, for example, dealing with uh, null uh, variables and so on. How many of you did programming in, with Java? Who knows Java? So how many times did you have null pointer exception? Yeah, exactly. So we all have it, right? Some sometimes um, we forget that something is null, and then you try to call method on it or try to use it somewhere, and then what happens? You have null pointer exception. Um, so Kotlin, for example, makes it impossible to have null um, um, for certain types of variables. Uh, you can prevent them to be ever null, right? So for example, in Java, if I say person uh, p, right? I declare the variable, which is uh, of type person. Uh, and then in Java, I p at this point is null, right? So at this point, p is null because I haven't initialized it, right? In Kotlin, you cannot do that. So in Kotlin, if you say p is of, pers of type person, it cannot be null. So you have to initialize it or you have to say that it is a nullable type. So using a question mark, you can kind of mark certain variables that they can potentially be null, but then you cannot pass them into things that don't expect null, right? So for example, if I have a function which says, um, I don't know, like um, uh, move, move a person to a new location, right? And I say person P, right? So I have a, a function which is called move, and then in my code, I say move P, and P is a, of nullable type. I cannot do that because P cannot be null. Like my method doesn't accept person that is null, right? I can say that, like here. And then in, in here, I don't need to say, if P is not null, do something. If P is null, do something else. I basically have it here that P cannot be null, right, by definition. Uh, and then the compiler will check it. So if I'm trying to pass P, this P, into this P, the compiler will complain. It will say, no, 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 look, uh, move only accepts not nullable types. So Kotlin is quite nice. Um, so if I finish this, it will gener generate the um, skeleton app. And then um, by default, uh, it generates a single activity. And this activity is launchable activity, so it can be launched. And it's kind of launched by default when I run my app, right? So my app consists of different activities. Each activity can use one or more fragments. And my app 
needs one activity, which is the main activity to launch when the launcher um, kind of um, launches the app, right? So in our case, I will change the fonts. So I have a new empty activity. Uh, I will use a custom font which is bigger. How about this one? More readable or bigger? Is it okay? Yeah, one more. All right, so what, ha oops, sorry, not that button. So what we have now is we have generated an app which kind of lives here in source and it has kind of a generated a testing framework like a skeleton for tests um, it has resources um, so this is a little bit complex um, but let's just navigate to this main activity so um, all types in Java when you have object-oriented types they uh, the convention is to start with capital letter, right? So for the types, the letters of types is capitalized and we use camel notation. For methods, we usually use small letter. Unless it is a static method, then you might use capital uh, letter for the static method. But typically methods and functions are with small letters, whereas the types are capitalized. Uh, this is a little bit different in C-sharp. How many of you program C-sharp? So in C-sharp, methods tend to have capital names, whereas in Java and Kotlin, they tend to have small. But the type itself is uh, capital M and capital A. So this activity kind of doesn't do anything, right? Uh, so we have a single, cla um, single class um, which has overwritten an onCreate. Uh, yeah, this is too small. Uh, let me make this one bigger as well. So this is a different font for the editor and different for the... Yep, so this one let's say 18 as well. Is it big enough? Um, we basically created a class which has uh, a single method which is uh, overwritten from the base class and this method is called onCreate and it basically accepts a bundle and we can see the bundle can be null because we have a question mark there, right? So our save instance state is of type bundle in Java, the type is first and the variable is second. In Kotlin, is um, variables and then types. Um, again, interesting discussion. Uh, why do we have that? What languages do you know that use um, type first and then variable name? And languages will have variable name and then type. So what languages do this? C, C++, Java, what else? Python, Python, JavaScript. Okay. Which do that? So sometimes you have a column here. <laughs> what else? Uh, 
else. No, not necessary. Do you know Rust? Okay, do you know Haskell? Yeah. So, what's the argument? For this or for this? To, to some extent, maybe, um, but um, the thing with those languages is that when you say, um, so let, let, let's try to define the function, so let's define the function f and then have a, a, a parameter here which has height and then variable, so let's say it's int of a and it returns an int. So where does the type for this function uh, returning int comes? It comes here, right? So I have a function f which returns an int which takes a single parameter, right? And then when I need to define a function g which takes f as a parameter, right? So I take g will take a function of type int, so it takes a function which returns an int and takes int as a parameter, right? And then it needs to be a function pointer or kind of a, a pointer in, in the, um, so we say, I don't even remember how, how you say it, you, you need a star somewhere um, in, in C, and then if you're returning f here, you're kind of uh, doing kind of the same thing. So you, you say um, int and takes int as a parameter. And then this reads extremely difficult, right? Because you don't, you're kind of losing track of what is the parameter and what is the return type and where things go, right? It gets kind of messy. Uh, Whereas if you always have things at the back, uh, you can easily compose things because you say uh, a int and it returns int. And then if g uh, takes something and returns something, it kind of uh, reads kind of a cleaner what is the parameter, what is the return, right? Um, so the from proponents of this type of, um, of syntax, they insist that it kind of makes it more consistent and the types are kind of always written in such a way that you kind of read it and then you get the type. You read it and then you get the type and it's kind of consistent and it's, it improves readability and composability. So you can compose more complex types more in a more unified way than using this notation because this notation is kind of, um, it's clean when it's simple but when you compose things, it gets kind of really messy. It gets kind of a complex, right? Um, all right, so we have um, a single uh, overwritten single function. So um, we need to um, kind of go back here for a second. And um, And check check one thing, which is um, yeah, the network is really slow. I didn't like the network.
done that. So So we have um, that's super slow. Um, so the the life cycle is um, how the activity is created, how it reacts to certain events, and then how it is shut down. So when the activity is created, it's kind of a called on create. So that's the first method that we kind of overwritten. And then when you um, when the activity is hidden, so when you have your activity and you press something and then something else shows up, a new activity shows up on top, your activity is in the background. The activity originally is um, kind of a post, right? Um, so you have, um, where is the nice diagram? Um, No diagram. Oh, come on. Just text. Yes, the diagram is here. It's a little bit small. So okay. So on create is a is a method which we overwritten. And then the next method that is called is on start, right? But you see on start is called multiple times. Every time, so this is how it goes. You launch the activity, then on create, on start, and on resume are called, and then your activity is running. And then when the activity is hidden, it gets post, and then every time the activity comes back, on resume is called, right? So from post state to running, you call on resume. And then when the activity is not anymore used, so for example, the user swiped the activity off, right? Uh, so you, you kind of launch something, you have it running, then you, you kind of press the home button, then it disappears and the home screen is on top now, right? So when the home screen is on top, your activity is in the kind of a background and you can come, it can come back. It's not stopped yet, it's, on, it's paused. But if the home screen is the one that it's on top and this one is not used for a while, the operating system may decide to stop it, right? Um, so then a stop is called. But let's say the operating system didn't call stop, but now you go, okay, show me all the background apps. You can press this kind of a tab view of all the background apps and you swiped it off. When you swiped it off, then on stop will be called. The operating system will try to shut down your app, right? So then on stop will be called and then on destroy. So you have two things that happen only once. On destroy happens only once, and on create happens only once, right? On start may happen multiple times because on start happens again when on stop was called, but the destroyed hasn't been, the, the app hasn't been destroyed yet, so then the app will be kind of uh, reinitialized when the user presses the, the icon again or wants the app back, right? Um, so if you need to conduct a, an action that is only one time for the entire duration of the app, you call it inside your onCreate method, right? But if you want to reinitialize something after on stop, you call it in on start. What happens is usually you have to have two matching things, right? So for example, when you're destroying something in on destroy, uh, then it's kind of, you know, on start and on destroy are kind of matching. And then on start and on stop 
are matching. So when you stop something and the user brings the app back, you need to restart it and on start, right? So um, this these two ah crap. Anyway, so <laughs> on stop matches with on start, and on pause matches with on resume. So every time every time you do clean up or you do something in one of them, you need to reinitialize it in the other one. If you want something global, you do it in on create and on destroy, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is kind of the life cycle and because of this life cycle we see um, we currently not destroying anything. We don't have on destroy method. Uh, you kind of rarely have it, right? So usually what happens is um, yes, I will install you later. Um, you have on create and on destroy you don't have and usually you have on uh, resume and on pause, right? Because sometimes you want to save the state, like if the user has your app and interacts with your app, but then you, for example, the user filled in partially the form, right? And then uh, someone called and a new activity came up, which is the phone call, right? And it's out of your control, like the user has a form, starts filling up the form, and you have cancel and OK button, and then the new, act <laughs> new things showed up, which is the new activity. Your app will, will call on pause and on resume because of this phone call, right? And then when your, the phone call finishes, the app will come back, will call on resume, and it will have clean um, fields because you just lost it, right? So on pause, you need to take all the entry which the user filled in, and then on resume, you need to populate the UI again because the phone will kind of recreate the UI for the, for the app, but the state will kind of happen from the from the bundle, like you see here, right? Saved instance state. Where this comes from? Well, this one comes from on destroy, right? So in on destroy, if you if you want to have some persistence in your app, you need to save something, let's say, to a disk, uh, and then. When the app is created again, on create will be called, and this save instance state will be brought back from the from the disk of wherever you stored it to recreate whatever you want to be persistent. Because we don't care um, for hello world app, this will be nil, and because this is nil, it doesn't matter because we you know we we passing it to on create, but we're not using it, right? Um, because the uh, the the super class is probably not doing anything with this state. We might be doing something with it, uh, but um, this one is it. And then the, the, so this is calling a super class on create, passing the saved instance, and the last line is uh, setting up the content. So each activity uh, has the, um, so each activity has all this real estate, which is on the screen, and this is called canvas, let's say, uh, it's um, yeah, so um, width and height, right? Some width and height, and the whole screen is occupied. And then what happens here? What is drawn here is up to you. You can either draw on canvas using kind of a pixel um, arithmetic, or you can let the manager to draw something, or like what we're doing here is you can design the layout in a form of XML uh, layout and then show it here. So if I go to resources, and if I go to layouts, I will see that I have a layout which is called activity underscore main, which is exactly what this is, activity underscore main. And we have a bit of a magic, which is r dot layout. r stands for resources, right? So it's like a, a bit of a shortcut for saying everything which r lives in the resources folder will be kind of accessible by this capital R. It's auto-generated class, which the uh, Android compiler generates for you. And then the second thing is the folder, which is here. So values will have r.values, layout will have r.layout, and so on. And inside the layout, uh, that structure is up to you, by the way. So like, um, if you put this somewhere else and reference like this, it will still work. It's just a convention, right? Um, so here we usually keep icons. 
here we we keep layouts uh, here we we uh, keep some binary blobs and and data and here we have key value pairs some values like uh, some constants or th things like this right so for example we have some strings uh, we have some colors uh, strings will be kind of a application name so we have a string which is a key is app underscore name and this is the actual string right so if I change this um, new empty application I will have spaces now in the app name which will be by the icon and I can reference it by saying capital R dot values dot app underscore name and then I will get this string right make sense uh, so for the layouts so this is the layout and if I open it you have two views you have either textual view because it is basically just an XML file or you have a visual view of how it actually looks on the screen right and here we have a little bit of a boilerplate so all of this is kind of a boilerplate code which says well use the size of the entire width and height of the parent which is the current activity uh, use the namespace from uh, from those two URIs and then the context is the main activity right uh, if we delete this it will still work fine it's just a context for the um, UI and then we have the actual elements which are in this layout and here we only have a text view so we have a library of different um, so if I go to design I have a library of different um, items so for example I can add a button uh, so if I call well, where is if I call buttons and I grab the, the very basic button, I can kind of lay it out here, right? And as I'm doing it, you can see this extra line. So do I want to align it with the screen or do I want to align it with something else? Is it relative to the parent or is it relative to some of the components, right? I can lay it out relative to this component, uh, left or right side, or I can center it on the... Um, on the screen so I will center it and then you will see in the text I now have two components one is text view um, and one is a button uh, and then the rest are the properties of those buttons right uh, of those elements so the property of the of this button is called um, button I can change it so I can change it to okay um, or um, now let, let, let's ch change it to cancel and then um, why would I um, use hard-coded string here if I want my app to be for example translatable to Norwegian right if I want this to make more universal I wouldn't use um, a uh, hard-coded string I would kind of uh, put the string into strings and use it from here because I can make those folders um, localized to each particular language by adding kind of a postfix of the country which it, it is for this localization right so the default values is for anything that doesn't have localization and then if I had another folder which says values dash um, um, uh, Norwegian book mole is NB then I would have strings which have the Norwegian text there and then if the app is run on the Norwegian localization it would use the strings from that other folder right so you can easily localize your app by referencing um, the um, constants from from those files um, so in strings I can kind of uh, copy this um, and say I have something I have a constants for cancel and in English or in default languages it would be called cancel um, usually if you know sometimes you want capitalized sometimes you don't so I can make it like this 
right? So then I have two constants, one with small c, one with capital, and then I can use them in this layout instead of the of this one by saying that it is actually and here I don't use this R thing I basically say um, yeah strings and then cancel small or capital because it's a button I would use capital right um, so now I do this and you see by default I will also see cancel but I can change it over there and I can localize it so now I can change the names of, on my buttons or everywhere else. It's the same for the hello world, right? Um, here it's hard coded, but usually we don't hard code it. We kind of uh, use it from the resource file. So again, I could kind of um, copy that and put a new constant, which I will call greeting. And then we can here we can say hello world. And in here we will use again uh, yes we're finishing. So I will use strings and greeting. Right? And it will say hello world because that's the default one for that localization that we are in. The default ones don't have any dash name. But then if you want to make it for a specific language, you say values dash nb and then create a strings. And then if this folder only has, let's say, a greeting, right? If I have strings in the nb folder and I only have this one, for all the other constants, the default will be used, right? But for this one, will so I'm like overwriting the defaults by a particular localization. All right, so um, we have to finish here. Um, I would like you to um, to try to play with it, add a handler to the button, and then from the handler to the button, like from this, like change the name from console to something else, or add an additional button, there is a function called um, start activity. And start activity takes an intent, and you can kind of, uh, ra you know, launch a new activity. So here, what you will do is you will click and say uh, new and you will add new um, yeah, new activity and you will add a new basic activity that will generate a new activity for you and then you can kind of go from one activity to the other and go back from this one to this one, right? So try to play with it. So try to generate a new basic activity and kind of uh, navigate with two buttons co going between one or the other using the kind of a start activity and uh, finish activity. So finish kind of uh, closes the activity and goes back to the one which called it and then start activity starts a new activity and puts it on top. But this one is kind of in the background. So the back button will by default, you don't program the back button, it kind of works by default and you, when press back button it, this one will be taken off uh, and the previous one will kind of show up. You can see you can use start activity just with the intent or with a bundle. So after you have the basic going with just the basic intent, try to get it going with the bundle. So to pass like have a text field in the first activity where the user says a name and the other one says hello name, right? Uh, so you pass that name to the second activity. I will write it kind of down in the... Um, on the wiki. Those, like, if you already did Android programming, I don't need to do that. Like, it's uh, it's a very basic. I will add a little bit more uh, um, extra task with networking, like, next time round, right? Once these guys get a little bit of a handle on, on basics. All right? Any questions? Yes? Show me. I don't, yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it would be if you run it on the emulator. We can, um, we can uh, check it. Um, although, I, I am using, uh, so here there is a, um, they might be a style, um, 
which is by default making some of the button fonts capitalized. I will check it out. I don't know. Uh, I would suspect it's just the UI kind of showing it capitalized that we don't see the difference, but if you run it in the emulator um, or run on the phone, it should... Yeah, I will check it out. Yeah, I have the emulator here. So we will see in a moment once it's... It crashed, I can't move it. Yeah, I will check. Yes? Sure, yeah, exactly. You, you, you can use you can use whatever, that's right. And the, like concept-wise, I will kind of uh, use Android as a, as a kind of a mechanism to discuss, but you for the project work, you can pick, you freely pick what, whatever. For some of the concepts, because we want to deal with peer-to-peer um, -peer networking and with routing, we may not even need a mobile phone. We just need to have kind of a concept of uh, packets being distributed. So you might be working on something that is like a library and then you just do all the development on a PC, right? Um, but um, if you want to experiment with iOS or something else, fine. So where is our app? Okay, it's deploying. So it's been compiled and now um, Android Studio is uh, deploying the app. So it, uh, in a moment it should show up, I would hope. Um, um, ah, crap. It, had compilation problems because we call this without the arguments. So one more time. This is not the the most performing laptop. So just take some time. So when it is compiled, then the script will kind of uh, package it up into the APK and then deploy it on the phone and then the phone needs to launch it. So the whole thing takes a while. It's good to keep the emulator running all the time so you don't kind of restart it because bootstrapping that also takes some time. Um, very similar setup is on iOS. You have Xcode uh, for developing the code. You will use Swift most likely. So it is kind of similar language to, to Kotlin. Uh, it has, it's not the same but it has kind of similar feel. Um, and then you kind of Bundle it, bundle it up and run in the emulator same way. Um, yeah, it's taking forever. Hello, we leaving. Sorry? I'm leaving. Yeah, I'm just finalizing the build. It's just taking too long. Say it again. I think so. Yeah. Huh? 
I know it's already over two minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> I'm worried that it might. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so something is not quite right. No, it was here last week. Yeah. yeah. So it says here that uh, I'm probably running really slow because I uh, didn't um, mark the hip size large enough for Android Studio, so it kind of probably struggles with with memory and. I could fix it, but I would need to restart. <laughs> so now the question is, will fixing it and restarting be faster than just waiting? So it's like <laughs> a su know. sunk cost. I've already waited three minutes. So <laughs> that's a dilemma, right? <laughs> mm. So it actually finished compiling it's in the like uh, assembly state, so like it compiled to the bytecode, and then it has to compile it again from bytecode to the assembly kind of the representation and bundle it up into the APK. Right, so that is a kind of a time-consuming stage of the build process. Um, yeah. You can compile with ADB, exactly. So you can use a command line uh, build and cradle to kind of do that. And it usually is better. Uh, yeah. All right, so I will kind of wrap it up and um, we will test it.